Good morning, church. How are you doing today? Good morning. Goodness, I don't know that I was so loud in the sermon. Good morning, awake. Hopefully you are now. Man, it's so good to be in the house of the Lord with you this morning. Uh, I think most of you already noticed we've got our next day-by-day uh, Bible study. So we're going through, we're finishing up Proverbs, and we're going through Hebrews and Philippians after that. Uh, we're encouraged you just to grab that. Go along with us in our Bible reading. We're really excited to continue doing that, so be sure to grab that on your way out today. I'm going to go to prayer for so if you would just pray for me, let's pray for uh, Father, we thank you so, so very much just for this day. We thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for uh, just holding off the nasty weather for us a little bit today. God, as we come to this place this week, I know my heart is just ready for worship. Um, this, this world continues to throw so many curveballs at us. But Lord, you are still good. You are still here. You're still present. So we just... We ask that in these next few moments, as we sing, as we look in your word, and as we take communion later on today, we would you just be reminded of your spirit and your presence in our lives. God, would you just fill us with your spirit? Would you make us more like you? That's our prayer today, Lord. May it be so, and according to your name. Lord, we love you. We pray to next song. Amen. 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 You're able to stand and stand with us. Psalm, 
It says, you open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him, and he hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord, and let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Amen. And that's something, you know, we gotta confess, confess how much we need him. We do need him. Amen. So sing this out as we
They're going to pick back up where it's a famine, right? And, and things are not going well for them. They're experiencing this famine that Joseph foretold. And so people are, you know, they're flooding in Egypt, just looking for help, looking for resources, looking for aid. And so Jacob, being the very dysfunctional father that he was, keeps his favorite son back at home and sends these other ten sons on behalf of the family, right? And now catch this. I'm going to just kind of sum up what happens in the next few minutes here. So the brothers show up to buy grain. Joseph recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. And so Joseph, being this very uh, shrewd and kind of uh, mischievous man that he is, he spoke harshly to them, right? And he accuses them of being spies. To try and clear their name, they mention that their, their father sent them. They have two, uh, two younger brothers, right? Benjamin and Joseph, one of whom has been taken from them. But they, of course, think that Joseph has passed away. Joseph continues to interrogate them and ultimately decides to imprison them for a couple of days as he mulls over their ultimate fate. Joseph decides what I should say. In verse 18, it reads, On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this, and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison while the rest of you go and take grain back from your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me so that your words may be verified and that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. Again, so the brothers mull over who will stay. Right? They, they recognize this is likely to do with some repercussions of karma basically coming back to bite them. But that, well, uh, the way they treated their brother Joseph so long ago was finally caught back up with them. So what once seemed impossible, right, is now happening before Joseph's very eyes. His brothers are actually apologetic, right? We, we talked about in the very beginning of the series how just awful they were, how, how disdain they had for, for sympathy and for compassion, right? Then, then their way of kind of backing down was actually just selling Joseph into slavery. Their original intention was to kill him, to straight up murder the brother. But now, before his very eyes, his brothers are apologetic. They're mournful. They, they regret their decisions. So their anguish isn't only coming from consequences, right? But it's actually from a genuine conviction that they did wrong. So seeing this, Joseph turned away from the group to cry. And I want you to kind of pick up a couple different times Joseph cries. Maybe it was due to flooding of traumatic memories coming back, or maybe it was due to the change that had already taken place at the Read a clear change that's taking place in his brother's lives. But Joseph is emotionally overwhelmed, right? He instructs the guards to take Simeon into custody. Then Joseph loads them back up with grain and returns their silver to them. And so when they go back to Canaan, they're unloading their pack, right? They just finally get home after a several day journey and they realize that their silver is in. That's like a, uh oh, like they're gonna, they, they're gonna think I stole my silver back. And so Joseph definitely has a weird sense of justice, right? It, it just goes to show this was not some sort of super saint. We often read scripture and these, these stories in the Bible and we think these people are superhuman, right? They have they're, they're these perfect lives. But Joseph had feelings. He was not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Right? His methods verged very closely with deception. I mean, he withheld critical information from his brothers. He, he didn't tell them his methods. He withheld his identity, right? He, he disguised himself. did everything he could to make sure that they had no idea who he was, and that they were clear of the mercy of his actions. So shrewdness is a word that a lot of scholars attribute to his actions, and shrewdness can be used for good or evil, right? And the way that we interpret Joseph's actions might reveal some of the ways that you and I process hurt and pain. In my understanding, I believe that Joseph's shrewdness here is for the intention of testing his brother's integrity. And so he challenges them, right, to bring their younger brother back the next time they come. So they are true to their word. Their integrity is confirmed, right? They return to Egypt with Benjamin, the youngest brother. They return not just the silver that was put back in their packs, but also additional silver to, to possibly, you know, cook over any sort of wrongs. So Joseph throws them a feast and tests his brothers once again by giving Benjamin special treatment. And yet, to his disdain, maybe, they don't act accordingly. They don't act like they're mad or angry at Benjamin. They don't show any animosity toward him. And in one final test, Joseph instructs his servants to fill his brother's packs with as much food as they can carry, but to put his own silver cup in Benjamin's pack. This is the final test. 
So after sending them on their way, Joseph then has them intercepted and accused of stealing. So each brother comes back before Joseph. They dump their packs once again before him, and it's discovered that Benjamin's pack had the silver cup. And in an attempt to save his life, all the brothers throw themselves to the ground. Right? You can see this all happening. These crazy, ridiculous brothers that Joseph probably has no patience for, no desire to be in the presence of. They are putting themselves at his feet. And Reuben pipes up and he tells a true story about Joseph. And Reuben's regret and shame come to the surface. And we read this in chapter 45. It all comes to the climax where we pick up with the story in chapter 45. It says that then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants. He cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him. And the Pharisees also heard about it. Now, cover your ears. But you have to imagine when I cry, it's like, I, ah! I mean, just years of pent up emotions. I don't know if it's anger, I don't know if it's fear. He just has this emotion, he just has to get out of it, right? But Joseph says to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now, do not be distressed, and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will be no plowing or reaping. But God has sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. A great deliverance indeed. It's an emotional reunion, discovering that Joseph is Joseph, right? I mean, his brothers, for so many years now, probably close to 20 years now at this point, would have thought Joseph was gone, dead, maybe in some other country, far off land. But for him to now be before them, to be the second most powerful man in the world, you just have to imagine the terror that they felt in this moment. Like, oh, like, you ever got caught with your hand in the cookie jar? I've had that a couple times in my life. But they knew that things were about to change. And so they intended to kill him in the worst possible, in the very best of their intentions, right? They wanted to just remove Joseph from their lives. But when confronted with that reality that he's neither dead nor out of their lives, but is in fact now in charge of them, literally has the power to drastically change their lives. Just with a mere you know, gesture, just like snap of his fingers, Joseph could have their lives right there in front of him. But in a mind boggling, near impossible act of humility, Grace. Joseph forgives them. Right? He tells them to come close. The, the wording in Hebrew would have meant them to come within distance enough to see eye to eye. He tells them not to be distressed or harbor any anger for themselves or their actions. It's nothing short of a miracle in my eyes, right? All this hurt, all the, the trajectory of Joseph's life to be sent into slavery, to be totally betrayed, to be, to be falsely accused of all these things, none of it would have happened. Brothers have not felt that anger, felt that animosity, that, that jealousy toward him. Right? The entire trajectory of Joseph's life has changed because of his brother's actions. And yet, Joseph will contend with that sentiment and tell us that while that may be true, that while his brothers may be responsible, right? It was for the world's benefit and for their benefit specifically that things played out the way that they did. So over the course of a few chapters there, as we close out the book of Genesis, Joseph is reunited with his father. His entire family comes into Egypt. It's an amazing emotional reunion. We hear again where, where Joseph cries as soon as he reunites with his father. But toward the end of Genesis, news breaks out that Jacob, their father, has died. And his brothers are still very fearful of Joseph. Right? They're afraid that now that, Joseph, that Jacob is dead, Joseph is, Joseph is still going to have these harbored feelings of bitterness and envy. Going to enact his vengeance. But Joseph's response in chapter 50, verses 19 through 20, is so profound, so full of truth. Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. See, that same pattern we mentioned as we opened today. Pattern of trusting in God, the pattern of, of giving God the glory when it was so easy for him to take the glory. Joseph continues to show his integrity, his character, 
right? And I am a place of God. A couple of verses, or a couple of chapters before this, we, we read about Jacob's story, and where he is he's so frustrated with, with Rachel, his wife, she's not able to bear children, right? He says, am I in the place of God? Am I in the place of God? That I, I cannot control why you cannot get pregnant, right? You can hear the type of character, but then to be removed from that, one generation later, later you see his son, who's had an entire life just full of humbling experiences, full of betrayal, full of hardship and pain, right? And he says, I am in the place of God. You don't need to be afraid. See, the same pattern for the hallmark of his life. A Methodist theologian by the name of John Walton once wrote, it's one thing to recognize the sovereignty of God. It's another thing to keep oneself and one's role Again, oneself in you and me, our role and proper perspective. See, Joseph understood his place and his role in life. And in our lives, right, perspective, it's crucial that we understand in our place and the roles that we have in life. The statement that Joseph made about what was intended for harm being reconciled by God, right? That is the truth that he only discovered through hardship and pain and disappointment. See, the initial betrayal, the, the slavery, the false accusations, the imprisonment, then the silence all contributed to this cumulative effect over his entire life, right? And when it comes to the climax, where he finally has the power, he finally is on the peak of life, if you will, he's able to kind of have a bird's eye view of his entire life leading up to those moments. And he realizes, as hard as they were, as emotionally low, right, as he was in those pits of life, Maybe it's spiritually dry as he might have felt in different times. All of that was for the benefit of his life, for the benefit of those around him. After being lifted to a place of authority and power, just a cop birds eye view of his life. And so it's only when being removed from his hardship and his pain, I promise we're going somewhere, I've kind of led you upon a little rabbit trail. But only being removed from his hardship and his pain did he understand how God could utilize all those things, all those experiences for good? And in his own words, for great deliverance, right? Similarly, when we are experiencing hardship or pain, let's just say hypothetically, when we're in the middle of a pandemic, right? And things are not going the way we expect them, of course, hypothetical. Right, that's right. When things are not going the way we expect them to, when we are experiencing hardship or pain, easy to get caught up when they're happening and think, oh man, life is just terrible, right? Sometimes we have the mentality that my life is not good, therefore God is not good, right? If we're just honest with ourselves, our default is to be driven by what is happening around us. When things are not going my way, therefore God is against me, right? That's the type of mentality we have. But the reality is that when Joseph experienced all those things, he was removed from that hardship, removed from that pain. He chose to recognize God's work in his life. See, Joseph knows who God is. He knows who he is. And he acted righteously because of it. He overcame betrayal, he overcame circumstantial hardship, he overcame lot, he overcame isolation. Now, the last thing we see Joseph overcome is bitterness, right? Bitterness and envy. He relinquished power he had to destroy his brothers to an terrible wrath and fury, right? And instead he chose to honor God by placing himself on an even playing field with his brothers, right? He chose humility. So the challenge for you and for me today is to choose humility. It's not a word we often get talked a lot about in our society at all. Tell you how broken relationships become when there is no humility present, right? Humility does not deny truth either, though, but rather true humility waits for the right time to bring truth. True humility isn't fully realized when we use it as a false pretense to get in our opinion on full display either. True humility is realized when we place the well being of others before ourselves. See, in our lives, when we often come to a point in our lives where we, we 
we've experienced pain, we've experienced hardship, and we learn truths. And often we see other people experiencing same sort of similar hardship and pain. Our initial reaction is to just reach out and tell them the truth, and tell them the thing that they really don't want to hear. I don't know about you, but I've had moments in my life where I wasn't ready to hear the truth. Anyone ever had a moment like that in your life before? And when we are still in the middle of pain, in the midst of hardship, it's hard to hear the truth. And I don't, I don't want you to think that I'm condemning anyone. I'm just as guilty of this. But I, I'm not patient enough with people. I'm not patient enough to be with them in the midst of hardship and pain and the pits, right? The emotional valleys of life. But the best we can do is be humble with those people. Be humble with the people that we have influence over. And acknowledge that they have value. I have to recover Joseph in his life. I mean, he overcame so much hardship. But his story makes true, and it has so much truth that it just reverberates through each of our hearts and our lives because he chose humility and he could have chosen power. Right? I don't know what, what Genesis would look like if Joseph had an act of vengeance, right? If he'd taken his brother's lives, if he put them in prison. I don't know what, what God would have done. I'm sure it would have been different. But Joseph chose that. It was a choice he was willing to be comfortable with and resting in, knowing that that was what God wanted him to do because he wanted to accomplish great things through Joseph's life. In your life and in my life, God is simply waiting for us to see people as people before we ever see them as a political opinion, ever see them as a sexual orientation, before we ever see someone as just wrong. It's important that we see them as a person first. There's certainly room and a time to address those other issues. But to see them as a person before anything else is important. So we fast forward to the beginning of the New Testament in the early life of Jesus. See, he was described as being full of grace and truth. He came not to be served, but to serve. He came to offer his life so that broken, messed up people like you and me might be saved. When it came time for his death, right, Jesus met with his disciples for one final meal. And at this meal, he watched the disciples speak, and he encouraged them. And he spoke about the betrayal that would happen, right? And in some of the accounts, I believe it's in the account of Mark, all the disciples were, were typically, if it were me, or if it were our society, right? If Jesus were to say, one of you is going to betray me, many of us, myself included, would probably been like, it's going to be that guy, right? But instead, none of the disciples said that. They all said, could it be me? Could I be the one that's going to betray Jesus? See, they were so convinced, and Judas himself was in that group, right? All of them were so convinced that they were not worthy to be in the presence of Jesus, not to be worthy of or deserving of anything that happened that was good, or any of the truths they learned because of their time with Jesus. I wonder how our world might look a little different, even in the midst of craziness and chaos, if we actually had a spirit of humility that said, before I ever go to put my feet on Facebook, before I ever have a, a conversation with someone, right, could I be the one in the wrong potentially? That's a question I think we could all learn here. See, as, as Jesus was preparing for the most humiliating thing imaginable on that day, right, the, being crucified on a cross, he knew there would be betrayal. He knew there would be false accusations. He knew there would be a time of silence where God would look away from his son. And yet, in spite of all this, Jesus took time to meet his disciples. He recognized who they were as people. So to cap off the dinner, right, he took a loaf of bread and a cup. So today, if you're looking for a response to what it looks like to take humility, to, to accept humility, to live in that way, there's a lot of communion today. So as instructions, um, I'll go ahead and invite you to go ahead and peel off that top little, that first little layer. And if you're at home, if you've got a cracker or something, a piece of bread, let me get that ready. See, on that fateful night, Jesus broke the bread before the disciples, saying, This is my body given for you. Take and eat.
gives the room some meaning. He also grabbed a cup. In a similar way, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. He told me to take and drink the room. So I'm going to go and pray for these elements. It's okay if you're already taking it, no worries. But I'm going to go and pray for these elements. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. Lord, I thank you for the life of Joseph and the hardships that he experienced, the pains that he had. God, would you help us to be more like you, to be more like him, to choose you know. God, as we take these elements, we ask that your spirit would cleanse us, would cover us, when it says that your sacrifice covered over a multitude of sins. You move our sins and our transgressions as far as from the east as to the west. God, if the only thing sin between us and righteousness sometimes is ourselves, would you help us to step aside and get out of here?
so much to 